now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello, I'm Tiki Fullerton every night, bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially when business and politics meet. Coming up, obey the law. Top cop James Shipton talks us through his new why not litigate approach against big bankers and why he believes any link between tougher policing and banking lending drying up is a myth peddled by the banks. What small business wants to see in next Tuesday's budget? Matt Prowse from Zero takes us through what he's hearing from his big client base. And what the why the way to see cost and benefit for big projects like NBN, Snowy Hydro and Inland Rail, all off the government budget books, needs a reassessment. We ask Infrastructure Australia Chair and former Brisbane Airport CEO Julianne Alro what she thinks. Well, these last few days has seen an extraordinary face-off between banks and regulators, much of it down at the AFR's Banking and Wealth Summit. The issue? Whether the actions of the corporate watchdog ASIC, bearing more teeth these days, is contributing to the credit squeeze, which is making borrowing for families and businesses noticeably much harder. Bankers first. Uh, this was AMP chair and former CBA chief David Murray. What we want the banks to do is to, to keep credit formation open and to, to do that um, they need to be well run uh, and they have to be able to form judgments themselves as prudent bankers always have. Uh, if we start to close down their capacity by diverting their attention off to millions of pages of black letter law uh, the fear of reprisals from regulators and most importantly the responsible lending laws then they will not do that so if, if we're to keep credit functioning during a downturn in the economy and we've had 27 years on the trot so we, we have to think about it it's our job to think about it well, later in the week, two of the big four bank chiefs, NEB's Phil Cronican and ANZ Shane Elliott, were on message telling parliamentarians to wake up to a big risk. Here's Shane Elliott. The Royal Commission and the laws that Parliament has already passed are having the most fundamental impact on Australian banking since the global financial crisis. There is more accountability, more attention from the regulators and more focus on customers. While there are more laws to pass and more bank-driven reforms to go, we believe that we're changing to better serve society. Before I finish, the availability of credit is on the minds of many. And let me assure you that ANZ is ready to lend, especially for housing and small businesses. Higher standards based in the law do apply, and some will find it harder to borrow than before. Our challenge is finding the right balance of prudence and availability within the regulatory framework. After a period of perhaps being too cautious, ANZ is easing back towards a sensible equilibrium. If we are to serve society, we must support the economy by lending responsibly, and that is what we are aiming to do. Now, broadly, the banks are claiming that the responsible lending laws are being used in a different way post the Royal Commission and the combination of the new punitive penalties for wrongdoing and the interpretation, perhaps, of what is and isn't responsible is seriously impacting bank managers' willingness to lend. Well, next came the Twin Peaks regulators' turn. Wayne Byers at APRA is calling for a standard test around loan serviceability. And ASIC's Jane Shipton was straight out of the blocks to debunk what he called a myth that the banks are now peddling. I'll be a big interview with him coming up in a minute. But the environment post Hain is new. No bankers in jail yet, and we're into the federal election campaign. ASIC was very, it was clearly very angry this last month when it revealed how slow banks had been on correcting the most obvious of failures, the fee-for-no-service scandal. Its tough new enforcement chief, Daniel Crennan QC, driving ASIC's why not litigate approach, warned the banks he would not tolerate any game-playing or legal brinkmanship. Well, one businessman told me this week he believed that banks and regulators no longer really interact at all for fear of being made accountable for bad interaction. Well, that's progress if true, isn't it? I hope he's wrong.
Let's go to politics because there's been some breaking news today. Labour has confirmed its negative gearing changes will come into effect from January 1 next year if they win the May federal election. The policy will see negative gearing limited to newly built homes and existing investment properties and capital gains tax discount will be halved as Leo Shanahan reports. Shadow Treasurer Chris Bowen has announced that Labor's new negative gearing policy will come into effect on January 1, 2020, under a possible shortened government. Under the Labor Party policy, people will no longer be able to claim a tax deduction on negatively geared property purchased after 2020, with new properties exempt from the prohibition. Christmas New Year is a quiet time in uh, the property market. It's a smooth time to implement the reforms and a sensible time uh, for these reforms to be implemented. So this has been Labor policy for a long time. We're thoroughly committed to it. It's the right policy, carefully designed for a, a range of market factors over a period of time. Uh, and the 1st of January next year is the appropriate time to commence it. And that's what a Labor government will go to the election promising and seek to pass through the parliament. Under the new policy, there will also be a 50% reduction in the capital gains tax for investors who sell their property after a minimum of 12 months, being halved from 50% to 25%. Despite a steep drop in property prices in major cities and projections of further falls by 8 to 10% with the introduction of the new policy, Mr Bowen said he would not consider delaying its introduction if prices continue to fall. And the policy that we're taking in the election is a policy we'll seek to implement. And Leo, I mean, obviously I considered a range of options to recommend to my colleagues for a start date. But a number of people in the property market said for me, to me, for example, that further delays would create considerable uncertainty. Uh, and certainty is king, of course, when it comes to policy. I note that the Property Council, for example, which doesn't support our policy, to be clear, I wouldn't want to suggest that they do, but they have said that this is a sensible start date if the policy is going to proceed. Um, and I think that's a reasonable comment for them to make. Mr Bowen also announced the halving of the tax on built-to-rent housing investments in a bid to encourage new housing supply. All eyes now turn to Canberra, where on Tuesday Treasurer Josh Frydenberg will deliver his first federal budget. It's expected to contain a surplus and tax cuts, promises that his counterpart, Mr Bowen, will be under pressure to meet. For your money, Leo Shanahan. Well, let's go back to our top story. Around bank responsible lending laws, ASIC chairman James Shipton agreed to talk a little more about his view that the banks were peddling a myth in linking the laws to a credit squeeze. I spoke to him earlier today. James Shipton, good to talk to you down at HQ. Now, someone of the weight and the experience of David Murray says, I quote, there's no way that a responsible lending law supervised by a conduct reg regulator will resolve in a healthy credit formation system. Well, I'm not going to comment to any particular person except to say that I firmly believe that the responsible lending laws, which have been around for nearly a decade, are a crucial part of a consumer protection mechanism. I also think that they fundamentally assist the uh, good governance and good business of a bank. Uh, and therefore, we've always been actively engaged with financial institutions on how to sort of best utilise um, that important mechanism. Well, this guy is, is also the former head of the Financial Systems Inquiry. Uh, now, he says that the regulator's position really takes us back to the pre Campbell days. What do you think of this? And, and do you think uh, Philip Lowe, Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, will be concerned? Well, all I can talk about is you know, our jurisdiction. And our jurisdiction is ensuring that the responsible lending laws, as they've been passed by the Parliament and implemented by the Parliament, sort of stand. Um, we have a consultation actually right now out on how the responsible lending laws operate in the modern day, particularly with technological advancements, more information, more knowledge, uh, not only in an aggregate sense, but also in an in individual sense. And therefore, we're happy to hear sort of representations. I don't think it's the time nor the place to getting into a debate or an argument or observations about what one person may say about them, except for I fundamentally believe that they have a such a crucial role, both in consumer protection, but also 
the good safety, soundness and business operation of financial institutions. You say there's a consultation program going on into responsible lending running up until May. Uh, banks are making decisions around lending every day. We've got ANZ Chief Executive Shane Elliott and NAB Chair Phil Cronick and they both agreed that a stricter interpretation of responsible lending obligations was contributing to a credit squeeze this week. Uh, Shane Elliott said it was inevitable the new emphasis meant home buyers and businesses will find it harder to borrow? Well, we haven't changed our view on responsible lending for quite a long time. We, yes, we update our guidance and we, I think the last time we updated our guidance was in 2016, but I'm struggling to connect the dots that our actions recently have suddenly catalyzed this credit tightening. But I think it's uh, a combination of higher penalties and also how uh, ASIC will look more forensically at how loans are approved. I mean David Murray who is also a former banker said quote loan officers would moderate their behavior in a way that would result in credit worthy borrowers either having loans delayed or denied and it takes much longer to knock back a loan. Well I don't think there's anything wrong with being thorough uh, and I don't think that there's anything wrong in ensuring that the laws as they stand today and as they've stand, stood for nearly 10 years. Even if it contributes to a credit squeeze? Well, I don't think that there is that correlation uh, and, I, and I don't think that we should be jumping to the conclusion uh, that it is the cause. From what I understand there's a range of contributing factors and as, I, as I've said we have a consultation now which we uh, want to hear feedback about any unintended consequences of this particular law, but the law is the law. The law hasn't changed in 10 years. Yeah. We're, we're happy, we're engaged, and we want to be constructive in knowing how to best apply the existing law as it is on the books. This legislation around uh, responsible lending though is, is principle based, it needs a reasonableness test, interpretation. Are we actually going to need some uh, court decisions to settle this? So uh, principle based is actually a good starting point because it allows for good and just discretion by those who are implementing the rules and that is in effect financial institutions, that is lenders. I've said for a long time that what the starting point needs to be is looking at the law, looking at these principles based regulations and laws and asking themselves, asking oneself, what is the fair interpretation? What is a good interpretation? What is the right interpretation of these laws? That's where I think there's been a uh, a misunderstanding. That is where I think more work needs to be done. When you're looking at these principle-based rules which are des deliberately designed to be able to be calibrated to different circumstances, instead of just taking a very technical black and white legal uh, approach to things, mm. asking is it the right thing to do? Is, it this a is this a fair interpretation? Am I acting in the best interest ultimately of the customer and the system as a whole. But now you've got this in the context of a regulator uh, which uh, post Hain at every step is asking why not litigate? Ah, well why not litigate only applies if you break the law and we stand by the deployment and utilization of all of our different regulatory tools. Responsible lending is a really good example. I guess being more fearful of uh, a more aggressive litigator, the banks would argue that makes them more wary to lend. Uh, you've got uh, an action out again, uh, I know, against uh, Westpac around the uh, household expenditure measure benchmark. Uh, now, uh, again, I think the banks might argue that the person with the best knowledge uh, these days uh, on the capacity to pay back a loan is indeed that person rather than the bank and and all this is sort of in the in the context of as I say uh, a, a, a newly uh, aggressive litigator again doesn't this go to a uh, credit squeeze oh, well it, no it doesn't I don't see the link the law says reasonable inquiries need to be made by lenders that's the law I do not believe uh, that our posture when it comes to breaking the law should 
make those individuals who are making these credit decisions fearful. In fact, I'd actively encourage financial institutions and their leaders to ensure that if their procedures are right, if their systems are right, if the way that they go about doing business is within the law, within the boundaries of fairness, of reasonableness, of professionalism, of putting the customer at the forefront of the decision-making process, then these organisations should have absolute comfort and the men and women who work inside them yes. should also have comfort. So you've got David Lindbergh at Westpac uh, this week uh, talking about uh, APRA, the, the other regulator, and its micro-prudential regulation. It wants a standardised test around loan serviceability. Now when you put that together with the corporate cop and ASIC's uh, new focus, uh, once again, doesn't that actually really raise the bar in terms of their ability to make loans? Well, uh, I would like to see the evidence of any sort of suggestion, whether it's um, the uh, in the jurisdiction of APRA, which um, the my colleagues at APRA will obviously deal with, or in the jurisdiction of, of ASIC. And again, right now, we have a consultation process. We are actively soliciting views, perspectives, and feedback from the financial institutions, from consumers, from stakeholders. We want to hear about the concerns, uh, about any unintended consequences. Uh, and again, one of the reasons why we embarked upon this uh, consultation process is to update uh, these guidelines, give guidance around the principles so that there is clarity. Mm. But what I'm really concerned about is that there is a link which, is, uh, which shouldn't be drawn between our posture when a law is broken and the performance and the function of good business. If financial institutions believe that they are within the law, acting in a, in a, in a safe, sound, legal, but above all fair capacity, then they should have confidence. James, on enforceable undertakings, now your new enforcement commissioner, Daniel Crennan, said this week, just because we're stuck in litigation doesn't mean that we will be in litigation forever. He says they, that the banks, uh, can admit to allegations and settle. Uh, now, the, the issue about this is uh, whether banks are at fault or not, if they ad admit fault, that then exposes them to class actions and uh, class actions as we know are, are on the rise and this becomes a, a very big concern for bank shareholders. Uh, look, we, we realise that there is this emerging uh, conflation um, in the, the courts uh, of class actions and regulatory actions. But the reality is the law is the law. If there is a breach of the law, we are duty bound we have an expectation um, to enforce that law and that is why we have very deliberately adopted this why not litigate uh, posture. But again, it's not why not litigate in for everything and anything, it's only a why not litigate posture, a question that we put to us when there is evidence that the law has been broken. Your other new commissioner, Karen Chester, is getting stuck into the issue of general advice and personal financial advice. Uh, she says she's going to crack down on it. Uh, there is a lot of confusion out there between general financial advice, personal financial advice. Uh, when are we going to get some clarity from ASIC as to what uh, you think about the difference? Well, we've got a body of work right now. We want to find out about how consumers, uh, users of financial advice, are reacting to and understand the concepts, which are very technical, of personal versus general advice. Um, we also see that there is um, a distribution channels which are linked to this of financial products. It's a very complex area. Uh, my colleague Karen Chester is absolutely right to highlight it because we want to get more evidence base, we want to understand the complexities. But if more gets classified as uh, per personal financial advice, once again it's going to threaten an already uh, difficult sector in terms of ordinary people's access to financial advice that they might need. Well, Tiki, the reality is, is that the, that's the law at the moment. These are the obligations at the moment. Yes, absolutely, we can engage and we want to constructively engage with everybody about the law. We want to understand um, 
intended and unintended consequences of the law. But right now, this is actually an important area of focus for us because actually, you know what? If advice is misused, if different channels are misused, there is real consumer harm. Remember, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're doing this because we want a fair, strong and efficient financial system. Mm -hmm. We want consumers to have confidence in our financial system. Our financial system exists for our citizens. James, quite likely the uh, next Prime Minister of Australia, Bill Shorten, has said last month if no one out of the banks goes to jail, if no one gets prosecuted or charged, I think Australians will say there's been a cover-up. Well, look, there's lots of commentary by lots of people about what we're doing. Once again, a very important person. But certainly, and we listen to all of the voices that we possibly can. And we do realise that there's an expectation on us, again, when the law is broken, to enforce that. Do you think bankers will go to jail? I can't possibly comment because I'm a firm believer in the system. I'm a firm believer, as my colleague Daniel Crennan has said, in the due process of going through different stages when it comes to criminal prosecution, of course involving the Commonwealth DPP, of referring matters to the courts and if necessary to the appeal system. Well equally Graham Samuel, former head of the ACCC said well, if you just get one scalp, one banker going to jail that'll probably satiate the public. Well again I'm not going to com comment on one particular individual or another but one thing is for certain we do realise that there is a value in the deterrence effect. That is very important. But again, we're going to use the deterrence effect, we're going to use the why not litigate posture, but equally we've got some fantastic other um, regulatory initiatives underway which we believe will also be yes. very effective, again aiming for a fair, strong and financial system. Graham Samuel also raised the issue of the time taken to litigate and uh, you know it's all very well having your teeth bared but these cases take time, sometimes years to get through and it, it's, it's not as easy as just uh, stringing them all up quickly. Yeah, exactly right. So there's been some misinterpretations of, of, of what we're doing, which is litigate everything or litigate first. That's not, the, that's not our strategy. Our strategy is to use different tools at different times for the end goal. The end goal is a fair, strong and efficient financial system for all Australians. Yes, we will absolutely use the court system. Yes, we will absolutely pursue breaches of law, but equally there are really important initiatives that we're utilising, technology, new supervisory approaches, engagement um, with consumers and uh, stakeholder groups to pick up intelligence of what's going on. We're going to use the full suite of our regulatory tools again, because the whole aim here, we want more fairness in the system. James Shipton, thank you. Tiki, a pleasure. After the break, a big week of M&A activity. We'll get our weekly market wrap with Michael McCarthy from CMC Markets. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. All right, let's go to Friday markets now. In fact, for the whole week, uh, joining me at the desk to unpack the key stories is our favourite Michael McCarthy from CMC Markets. Uh, Michael, been quite a busy week. Uh, something straight after um, close, Rio's called a force majeure on some of its supply contracts because of Cyclone Veronica over in the Pilbara. Well, they're buying themselves a bit of breathing space, aren't they? And while it sounds very dramatic, the reality is... It does is sound dramatic, force majeure on a contract, you know. Yeah, yeah. But they wouldn't do it unless they felt they had to. Yes. Uh, and clearly most of their relationships are long-term relationships. So they'll be doing their best to make sure that they can backfill any production misses. So we would assume that this force majeure doesn't mean the whole contract has collapsed. It means that it means that in the event of a weather event like this, you don't have to commit to supply the same amount, presumably. Absolutely. Yeah. There are going to be some interruptions. It's yes. value deferred, not destroyed. So I don't think the share price implications are too large. Yes. But clearly we'll be looking at any details that Rio have given around this. And of course, there's potential for others in the region to issue so similar BHP, notices. So BHP, Fortescue. Uh, Fortescue. Um, so, and what is the soggy iron ore price at the moment then? Well, it's remained firm. Uh -huh. And although it has pulled back from highs around 640 yuan, we're still sitting around 620. So much nearer highs than lows at the moment. All right. Now, huge um, drama over this uh, takeover offer that West Farmers has lobbed in, $1.5 billion offer for Linus. Uh, uh, we had Amanda Lacaze on last night saying, mm, no, nah, 
um, but she's not very happy as, at how West Farmers, in a very seemingly rather ungentlemanly way, seems to have gone over the top <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and is talking to the Malaysians about well, maybe bringing the whole operation down here. Thanks very much. All fair in love in market, so yes. I, I wouldn't be paying much notice to that kind of call, but a, an extraordinary move. And it just goes to show, if you hang around in markets long enough, you will see everything. <laughs> if if we'd drawn up a list of the top 200 companies and said which are potential acquisition targets for Wes Farmers... Wouldn't have been on yours. Would have been at the bottom of the <laughs> list. So it just goes to show that... Well, uh, just hang on a minute. If a, a, let, just, let's put that huge and unpleasant basket of sovereign risk to one side, <laughs> OK, if we yes. could just to say. Um, I mean, the market opportunity here in rare earths, there is Linus with well, the Chinese, we've got one lot. Basically, Linus seems to have all the rest of the market sewn up. Well, that's right. Their Meltwell ore body in uh, Western Australia, uh, according to the company, is yeah. the only prime asset outside China that's currently being exploited. Isn't but that worth something? Isn't that worth a risk? It could well be, but the issue with many of the rare earths is the pollution they cause when you process them. Yep. So it's not just about finding the minerals, it's about getting the permissions to process them. Well, that's where the sovereign risk is, because the Malaysians are, as I understand it, they're, they're sort of half interested in the jobs and the investment, which is what Amanda Lacaze is trying to push them on. Absolutely. And it's been operating there for a, you know, a while now, years now, um, as opposed to the, the waste issue, which some of the Malaysians are not happy with it all. No, it appears there's some disagreement between the company and the government over this. And even within the government, I think. Yes, yeah, mm. and it does look like that they've been caught up in a political firestorm over there. All right, all right. Brookfield, HealthScope, what's happening there? Uh, regulatory issue, um, because of the complicated nature of the bid, remember they've actually made two They've offered a scheme of arrangement for all of up, the shares it? and a takeover <laughs> bid at 10 cents lower. So there are two deals here. And to be able to put all the information to shareholders in one hit, mm -hmm. they need certain court approvals and regulatory approvals. And so they've sought permission from ASIC to uh, an extension of normally a two month deadline after announcing a bid to lodge mm -hmm. documents so that they can lodge it all together. And I think this is better news for shareholders. They won't be going on the one hand, on the other hand, it'll all be in one package. It's only a three week delay. Well, um, it's interesting to see what will happen after um, uh, Ben Gray was successful with Navitas. We'll see what Brookfield does with Hellscope. Well, it does mm. open that door, doesn't it? It does. The Private equity is on the way. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Now, um, the, the other thing I must ask you about is the bond yields this week. Extraordinary. Yeah. What a week. Yeah, but what does this mean? Are we all sort of heading for recession? Bond yields are pricing a much lower growth environment than mm. most share markets. Mm. And this has to be resolved in one way or the other. Now, I've got to say, history shows bond markets tend to be right more often than share markets. Really? So this is a serious warning. Australian 10 year bond yields are at their lowest point ever. All right, the US 10 year bond is its lowest since the GFC. These I know, but we're in unprecedented times. Our Phillips curve doesn't work. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are not right. Absolutely isn't they? right. Conventional wisdom is not working in this world of central bank accommodation. But I would point out German, Swiss, and Japanese 10 year bonds are all in negative territory. There's a half percent penalty for buying a Swiss, a Swiss 10 year bond. So these are extraordinary times. And, and we can't ignore these signals, particularly. They don't necessarily always lead to the same outcome, mm -hmm. but they are clear flashing red lights. Very interesting week, Michael McCarthy. Thank you for that. Thank you. After the break, expectations ahead of the federal budget next Tuesday. Matt Prowse from Zero and Julianne Alro from Infrastructure Australia next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Well, it's been such a busy week. I'm very glad there's a weekend to regroup before the next week's federal budget because it's going to be a huge one. Uh, it's the government's last big pitch to voters before the May election and it looks like it's got a bit of cash in the old coffers. What will be on the cards for small business? Here's Zero's head of industry, Matt Prowse, a little earlier. Matt Prowse, good to chat. Now, uh, the budget next Tuesday. Is it going to be a good one for small business, do you think? Absolutely. I think we're going to see a few policy initiatives in the, the upcoming federal budget that are really going to help small businesses grow here in Australia. Which ones are we talking about? Well, I mean, I think the first thing the government's clearly indicated is that the um, instant asset write-off is going to be extended and made permanent. Yes. Now, I think this is really, really critical for small businesses. We've kind of been teased for the last few years around the instant asset write-off. It's going to be extended for another year and another year and another year. Government's signalling that as part of the budget, the instant asset write-off is going to be increased to $25,000 and then made permanent. We see this as a really positive sign for small business because what we know is that small businesses really need certainty in order to actually... Uh, 
uh, plan, plan, plan ahead and actually prepare for the, for the coming years ahead, not just for the next 12 months. Just remind us of the definition of a small business for that sort of thing. Uh, the law as it currently sits defines a small business as having $10 million worth of turnover. Mm. Uh, so the ATO uh, definition for income tax purposes is a $10 million turnover. We think the overwhelming majority of Australian small businesses fit inside that. And we've got some um, data through Zero Small Business Insights actually looking at what uh, instant assets or what assets have been claimed uh, by Australian small businesses in the 2016-17 financial year. And it's the kinds of things you'd expect to see. It's critical plant and equipment, it's uh, technology, and of course it's motor vehicles. Right, you mentioned income tax there. Now obviously that is much, there's a lot of expectation around some sort of income tax cuts. Uh, why will that be so important to small businesses? Well, I mean, I think we can expect to see personal income tax cuts. I think that's where the government's probably going to start yes. its uh, tax cut story for this budget. The thing to recognise is that individuals are, you know, the individual taxpayer quickly becomes an entrepreneur. And we're seeing a lot of the sole traders. It's the largest group of businesses in Australia. There's more than 1.1 million sole traders today. Effectively, if you give an income tax cut to individuals, you're giving an automatic income tax cut to those sole traders. But also individuals on salary and wages, they're going to see themselves with a little bit more capital available and that gives them the opportunity to actually create new businesses themselves or maybe have a side hustle or some other uh, business activity to support their income and, and do something entrepreneurial and of course being entrepreneurial is going to give businesses an opportunity to potentially grow and that creates you know additional revenue for government but also creates employment. Do you think Matt there might be anything for um, to, to encourage more employment anything uh, in the budget in the jobs market particularly? Uh, not necessarily, not from what we've heard about the budget directly, although we do expect, as always, to see a range of uh, new incentives for training and for, for workplace development for, for employers and employees. Mm. Uh, we're also looking at, as we said, with the introduction of single-touch payroll applying to all employers from the 1st of July, we're going to start to see really high-quality data flowing into government, which will give them a much clearer picture than they've ever had before about the true state of employment in Australia. It's also going to give employees far more certainty. They're going to be able to log in into MyGov if they're paid under single touch payroll, make sure they can see uh, their year to date payroll and earnings figures, but also make sure that their superannuation is being paid on time by their employer. A bit of uh, politics going on uh, between the banks and the regulators at the moment about this whole idea of responsible lending and whether more aggressive uh, regulators are actually impeding the bank's willingness to, to lend. Now, uh, that aside, at the level of small business, what sort of small businesses are doing well and being able to access uh, capital, access loans? So the Zero platform today integrates with a range of bank and non-bank lenders and what we're seeing is that digitized small businesses with up-to-date records, so of course one of the benefits of the Zero platform is being connected to the banks, being connected to tens of thousands of trusted accountants and bookkeepers here in Australia, they've got probably the most accurate, the most up-to-date figures in Australia and it's much easier for the bank or for the lender to have assurance around the health of the business and that's making it much easier for them to deliver positive and faster lending outcomes for small businesses. So I agree that it is hard for small businesses to raise finance, but we know that small businesses that are digital have the best possible data, which means it's much easier for the bank to make a better decision about lending. Mm. And more broadly, do you think it makes a difference to small business, again on the ground, if the overall economy looks stronger? Because, I mean, we've got some of these uh, growth forecasts which I suspect are going to be, uh, you know, re-looked at. We're looking at a slightly slower climate now, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think Australian small business are confident about the future, but they are also mindful that there's a few things going on in the in the political world, not just in Australia, but around the world, that, that introduces a degree of uncertainty. Um, but what we do see is that the things that Australian small businesses are focused on, that's growing employment, that's making sure they get paid on time, we're starting to see policy measures that are there to help them, and that, of course, is going to build confidence. Right. And finally, as I understand it, on uh, budget night, you're going to have an app yourself. Uh, absolutely. On budget night, uh, we have a we have a camp of uh, of budget fanatics at zero working through both the the budget papers and the and the treasurer's speech, and we'll be running a, an event for our trusted accountants and bookkeepers uh, the morning after the budget. Indeed, a lot of midnight oil being burned, I think, all round. Matt Prowse, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. 
Moving to infrastructure now, and recently we've had some folk on the show warning the government about overspending. Infrastructure Astra Super Australia's chief economist Stephen Anthony expects a surplus to be wafer thin, so he's calling for sensible restraint around some infrastructure. And Nikki Hutley, Deloitte economist, says there's a lack of transparency around the justification of big infrastructure projects, especially around election time. She says budgets should be less political and more about smart, efficient policy planning. I put some of these concerns to Julianne Auro, Chair of Infrastructure Australia. Julianne Auro, nice to talk to you. Now we're three or four days ahead of the budget. Are you expecting a lot of announcements around infrastructure, do you think? Uh, I think it's already, you know, fairly clear, um, Tiki, that, you know, both both sides of the political um, divider are looking at infrastructure as an important um, part of the, this election. And, um, and we, you know, we'd expect the budget to be, you know, part of that process. Yeah. So uh, the sort of big projects that are on the go at the moment uh, include, obviously, the NBN, but things like the inra inland rail and also snowy. Questions, Julianne, at the moment about the cost-benefit analysis ar around a lot of these projects, which are off balance sheet, and the NBN is an absolute classic, which everybody says will inevitably have to be written down. Yeah. Well, the, the NBN was um, considered and I think agreed before Infrastructure Australia was formed, so uh, you know, sort of it's, it's, it's a business case that... Um, we didn't see. Yeah. Um, of, of the three you mentioned, the only one that's that's come to us um, at this point is the inland rail. And the part of the inland rail we saw was, um, I think it was the Melbourne to Acacia Ridge um, part of the project. Um, we that, pro that project came to us from the Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development um, you know, back a few years ago. Um, it it had, a, had a BCR of, of just a bit above one. Um, and there was also some... Um, Ex explain what a BCR is for downs. our viewers. Oh, sorry. It's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. Um, ratio, I should say. Um, so basically, if we invest a dollar, you get at least a dollar back. Mm. Um, so, you, you know, for a lot of projects, particularly when they're um, not dealing necessarily with large population groups, you know, I think, you know, making sure we don't lose money on the project is, 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 not, is not a bad place to start. Mm. With so many projects, so you know, we have to look at assumptions. So the rigor um, around the analysis is there, but we have to also work with the proponents about whether the, the assumptions going into that are valid. Um, we also understand they are assumptions, they are forecasts. They're not always um, easy to, to, to quantify and support. So with any of these projects, we'll look at both upside and downside scenarios. Mm. And, uh, and as part of our um, report back to, to the government, we'll draw attention to those things and to where we see our various risks in the project. But we don't necessarily uh, see a project again after that time, um, unless for some reason the project changed substantially and the government wanted to have another look at whether the business case was still valid. But that is not our call. Yeah. So um, you, you know, we, we, uh, we see it at a point in time with those particular assumptions. And as I said, we identify what we see are the, uh, the uh, critical elements of that and where there are risks. Uh, and as I said, and sometimes we see there's potential upsides yeah. that haven't been Do, quantified. Yeah, really interesting at the moment because, of course, people are talking about government, state and federal using infrastructure to help fire up the economy. We've got these very low interest rates at the moment. Seems a good time to do it. Um, equally, Jennifer Westacott from the Business Council of Australia was talking to me this week. She said, well, some of these big projects, maybe we need to look at them in a way beyond just a, a pure cost benefit analysis and look at elements of public good in the same way that investors are looking at ESG at the moment, which might cost return to shareholders. Do you think that's a way that we should be going? Perhaps Infrastructure Australia should be commissioned to look at things like that. Uh, in Infrastructure Australia's role is to provide economic advice to the government. Uh, we develop a, um, a business model um, template uh, that we, we discuss with the various jurisdictions, we discuss with the you know, Treasury and other organisations. So we do stick to those things that we see are, are quantifiable and that have merit you know, when they're starting to be assessed in, in something like Treasury as to you, you know, mm. whether they should be recommending things to the government. Uh, I, I think there's often 
and, and, and I think you know any government or uh, aspiring government would tell you ultimately the decision made is made by the government and they bring a series of, of inputs to that decision making process. Um, I don't think any of that invalidates though that everything should have, uh, I believe at its core, a well understood business case. If, if nothing else, even if it is a marginal business case, when you look very hard at at the risks around delivering that business case, it then you know throws up signals to proponents as to what sort of procurement they may need to use, what sort of risk management may they need to use. Maybe that we can also bring to their attention um, opportunities that hadn't been necessarily included in the original business case. Mm. So e even even so, even going through that business case process, I believe throws up. Um, potentially a much, much better project. And in some cases, I think it throws up the fact that there is more than one option to solve a problem. Uh, one of the things we, you know, we, I suppose the focus we take to infrastructure when we do things like maybe our infrastructure audit is what we are looking at are often the gaps and in some cases the opportunities in our infrastructure and what are the future drivers of infrastructure need, you know, whether that's population, economic growth, um, you know, even climate change and, yeah. and, and a whole range of other. Are inputs. there some gaping holes um, at the moment? You know, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think no one would agree that we've uh, we've got it right. And there's everywhere you look around this country because of um, future opportunities and future gaps. You know, there is a great need for infrastructure, and we'll be putting out our um, our five year update of our audit. Uh, in mid, uh, but I think at the end of June this year will be finished, mm. and that will look quite strategically right across the nation at a whole range of things, and not just looking at you know sort of the obvious ones that are controversial at the moment, like the cities, but we'll also be looking at not only our, um, our close by regional towns, but also you know remote regions and and different needs, and in clearly each of the way those communities have to be looked at, you yes. know, I, I think have to be looked at through a whole series of lenses. And I think that's, you know, that's ultimately the role of the government. And I think the work that Infrastructure Australia done is an important element of that in trying to make sure we do the best possible thing we can, uh, and particularly in identifying all those risks and how they can be managed. A lot, uh, a lot, and, you know, I think the simple reality is there's a lot to be done, so you've got to find some way of prioritising them. Indeed. Um, it, a, it may a not lot be of talk, perfect. A lot of yeah. talk, Julianne, in the last sort of six months about uh, the idea of JJC Bradfield's uh, concept of turning Rivers Roundup north and a huge pipeline project down to the south. Do you think that could ever be a serious business case? Oh... Uh, yeah, I know they've been looked at by you know earlier all my I think generations and have always found problems with those things. So um, I, I don't think it's up to you know um, Infrastructure Australia to you know to, to make any comment on those things until we've actually seen what are the actual um, right you know various elements of that thing. Yeah. Um, you know it, I don't even know if it's possible. So you know yes. I don't think it's it's there. But uh, I think sometimes you know we have to. We have to think big and then come back to what is actually achievable. But I don't think, I think if we don't start off with a bit more visionary approach to our things, you know, we can end up doing, you know, quite small things. And I don't think that's always the right outcome. Yeah, but you I, yourself. Said, I don't think anything to, to, like that denies that we shouldn't put rigour to the process. You yourself have run an airport, um, you've, you've developed, uh, you've built runway um, and you've developed land. Now I was really interested in your selection, your hire of chief executive this year in Romley Maydew, um, given her green credentials and whether you, um, that influenced you in terms of the way future infrastructure projects are going to be thinking. Uh, I don't think it was a particular driver of why we, we selected Romilly. I think um, what, what made Romilly um, stand out for us as a candidate was her um, incredible experience in bringing stakeholders together to, to tackle you know, quite complicated and, and often in some cases quite unpopular problems. Mm -hmm. um, I think more and more as I observe you know, how we make infrastructure decisions in Australia, uh, I think more and more we need to be doing um, better work with our planning and, and some of our decision making. So, uh, and to me, we need to see more and more cooperation between the various levels of government and probably a longer term focus 
on how we do our planning and then you know I think that then sets up a fairly natural pipeline as to how we should be then tackling how we fill those gaps okay. in infrastructure. Okay. Um, each of the states have now got an eye body um, I, and I'm seeing more and more I think the role of Infrastructure Australia is to be part of that broader stakeholder management, you know, a broader role in advocacy generally to get better planning and getting better decision making and, and a better way of analysing where our, our, our real needs and um, how we can best fill those gaps. So I think what Bromley brings to the table, quite apart from her you know, long experience in, in, um, in cities and property development and, and also some of her personal experiences you know, being um, living and working in regions, is you know that that um, Romley is, is you know I think her greatest attributes her experience you know, as a, as a CEO able to develop strategy, but also in how to engage with stakeholders mm. and um, and 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 bring teams together. You know some of the work that the, you know the Green Building Council um, has done, and I I was involved in some of that with um, the airport back in the day. Um, you know these are hard you know core property developers. And now 650 you know, organisations in Australia are involved in that council and over 2,000 projects have been certified. Mm. So you know, to me that, that shows in, in, a, in a tough environment, you know, someone who can really um, you know, uh, bring teams together and, um, and help people right. adopt and support standards that are very important. Well, we look uh, for... But we also do see in our... We, uh, Sorry, I was just saying, in our recent policy paper on urban development, we also did, you know, stress the need for making sure our cities, and in fact all our um, cities and towns and regions, stay livable. And so I think, you know, that does come back to the quality of life and how we how we do build. And you know, we'd like to see, you know, far more of that set set into the frameworks for projects. Mm. Well, I look forward to interviewing you yeah. both again and and possibly after your big report in June. Julian Anna, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, good to talk to you, Tiki. After the break, Visi Chairman Anthony Pratt has been revealed as Australia's wealthiest individual. We'll get more with John Stensold, curator of the Australian's Rich List, out this weekend. Welcome back. Well, Anthony Pratt, Visi Executive Chairman, has come in as the wealthiest person in the country with a total fortune of over $13 billion. He's at the top of the list, which will be published by the Australian in tomorrow's weekend paper. Inside, you'll find the details of all 250 wealthiest Australians. Lucky old things they are. For more, I'm pleased to welcome the editor of the list, John Stensold, who joins me live at the desk. Well, John, congratulations. It's Thank quite. You. It's quite a list um, and I see at the top is Anthony Pratt who's done pretty well on the packaging front especially with um, all the incentives in the in America. That's right he's a big fan of those Trump, Trump tax cuts yes. and the acceleration of the depreciation you get to write off all your big capital expenditure mm. in one year over there I mean you think of how much money you've got to put into building factories you can write that all off in one year. It's a, it's yeah. a, this is a superb move for him, really. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Now, he is, quite bizarrely, only $20 million ahead of Gina Reinhardt. Really <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to check those figures a couple of times and make sure that I was thinking, goodness me, imagine having a tie at number one. It was yeah. pretty close. So. That's extraordinary. Yeah, right. So we know where she gets her money from. Um, uh, Roy Hill, presumably. That's yeah. right. Well, that's very, very profitable. And I, I wonder, you know, this financial year that we're in now, given commodity prices have come back a little in the, in the last few months, it could yeah. be even bigger next year. Yes. So uh, number three was property. Yeah, Harry Triggerboff, another yeah. perennial, 86-year-old, uh, yeah. uh, still doing uh, very, very well. We've actually got a you know, feature on him. We gave a bit of a taster in the paper this week. Ah, yes. He missed one day of work last year. So he reckons the commercial, uh, sorry, the residential property market's down. So he's yeah. got to redouble his efforts to keep working. So well, presumably that will come off with you know next year and the year after. That'll start filtering through, or is he, you know? Well, I mean, he's keeping more of his apartments to rent out, so you can rent them out. But Harry actually went off for the first time and went and thought, well, there's all this talk about the industrial property market going really well. Why don't I invest in that? But he did the numbers, and he figured that even though. Uh, can, even though residential's diminished, yes. he can still make as much money in that as he could industrial, so he'll stick to what he does. Tell me, why is it that Mike Cannon-Brooks and Scott Farquhar live next door to each other? I mean, they, live, they work together, they founded the company <laughs> together. Why on earth would they live next door to each other in multi-million dollar houses? Well, maybe it's just two nice houses came up on the market at the same time. It's an extraordinary story, isn't it? So it is right, a great story. Next to each other and then going home and well, probably, I think they've got a, um, 
Yeah. Know, they've got a door between the fence, the back fences, probably to get into do each other's houses. So they've made the obviously the top ten. Now look uh, further down, but but um, young rich listers, tell us about um, Toby Pierce and uh, Kayla. Is it? Yeah, Kayla at Sunas. I think this is a fantastic story. So. Uh, Toby's 26, the youngest person in the list, and Kayla's 27, so they're expecting their first child in May. Yeah, I saw her in her stretchy, looking fantastic in her stretchy all-in-one, uh, whatever it was, gym thing. Absolutely. She, the, it's an amazing story. So five years ago, she, uh, well, she was, she's a gym instructor, a fitness instructor, so mm. she puts together all her tips and ideas into an e-book. It goes viral and huge around the world. And she's now got 11 million uh, followers on her Instagram account alone, which is just about half of Australia. But she's huge in America. Yes. Sweat is their app and fitness. And they've got, uh, well, it's more than $100 million revenue they're making every year. Yes. And all based in Adelaide. You can build a global company from Australia these days. So in a way, there's a bit of tech to that. Obviously, there's obviously a bit of sweat involved as well. But has tech contributed to, you know, at the same rate to the new billionaires? Well, it's, it's getting there. There's 14 people from technology on the list. So we still make a, a lot of our money in those old industries like mining, mm. investment, property in particular. Property is the biggest thing on the list. So mm. you're right, we have online retailers. We have you know, online in other facets like fitness. But it, it's interesting. Uh, those Atlassian guys are a bit of an outlier at the moment. And, you know, technology uh, industry is. probably lags behind the other places around the world. And people giving money away at all? Yeah, I think there's a noticeable trend. Uh, that living pledge that Bill Gates came up with a couple of years ago for people to give away the vast majority of their wealth, mm. if not all of it. It's Andrew Forrest, Len Ainsworth, are one of the oldest people on our list, 95. They've signed up to that. And Paul Blackburn, we had in the paper this week already, yeah. for uh, almost $500 million uh, income. He's got a young family and he's already said, uh, we're going to give this most of it. We'll support our kids, but you know they're not going to inherit this. They need to go out and do their own thing, which I think is a very interesting trend. That is extraordinary. So, uh, look, well, well, well done to the top ten. And so we've got the full list coming out in the magazine over the weekend. Absolutely. Yeah, Saturday newspaper, 250 on this list. So it's the yeah. biggest uh, study of individual wealth that's ever been done in this country. Yeah. John Stantel, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tiki. All right, well, that is all for the show tonight. On Monday, I'll be speaking with the former chair of IFM Investors, Gary Weaven. Thanks for your company.